Our next set of diseases to cover are going to be diseases that affect the cardiovascular and lymphatic systems of the body. There is a little bit of terminology that we need to go through before we begin these, this area for, of diseases. As many of you probably know, your cardiovascular system is going to be composed of your heart, your blood, and your blood vessels. Therefore, we're going to be talking about diseases that can affect your heart or your blood. Your lymphatic system includes many different organs, but some of those are your lymph, your lymph vessels, your lymph nodes, your spleen, and your thymus. So we'll discuss diseases that can affect any of these organs or areas of the body. Let's now recall a few terms that we learned in Chapter 14. Septicemia is the term we use for the presence of a pathogenic microbe or their toxins found in the blood. Any disease of the cardiovascular or lymphatic system is going to include septicemia because anything that's found in the lymph is eventually going to be dumped into your blood. Sepsis is the term we use when there are pathogenic microbes in the blood that is accompanied by inflammation. When someone is septic, you are going to see things like fever, chills, and an increased heart rate. A new term is lymphangitis. Lymphangitis is the term we use for an inflamed lymphatic vessel. When someone has lymphangitis, you typically see this red line transmitting down the arm and sometimes the leg. This is following the pattern of the lymph vessel itself. Severe sepsis is what we call sepsis when someone has all of the symptoms of sepsis plus a lowered blood pressure. If someone's pressure gets so low that we can't control it anymore, they go into septic shock and then we're talking a very serious disease. Our first disease we need to discuss as we're discussing diseases of the cardiovascular system is endocarditis. Endocarditis is most often caused by the movement of streptococci from the mouth into the bloodstream. This is going to occur when someone does not have proper oral hygiene. Bacteria leave the teeth, move into the pulp of the tooth, and then follow the blood moving into the heart. We can also see these sorts of infections when someone gets an unclean piercing, typically a piercing somewhere in the mouth or around the mouth. You can also get endocarditis by an infection with staphylococci, and this is going to be a much more fatal type of endocarditis. You get rapid destruction of the heart valves, but it's much harder to get a staphylococci infection in the heart than it is to get a streptococci infection. Our second bacterial disease is called tularemia. Tularemia is a zoonotic disease typically found in nature in rabbits and ground squirrels. This disease has an etiology called Franciella tularensis. That is the actual name of the bacteria. The way you get the bacteria from the rabbit is to get bit by a tick or a deer fly that has bitten the rabbit or the ground squirrel and then bites you. You can also have transmission from contact with rabbit or squirrel feces or urine, but that, however, is much less common. The most common sign we see when someone gets bitten by a tick or a deer fly, and they have now received tularemia, they are going to have a very nasty ulcer at the site of injection. The bad part of this is once you get bit, the ulcer happens, but the bacteria, the Franciella bacteria, moves from that injection site into the blood and then makes its way into your respiratory system. People that have extreme side effects from tularemia typically have developed a pneumonia from the bacteria moving through the blood into their respiratory system. This picture over here shows you where the most concentrated areas of tularemia are. As you can see, it's here in the Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri area. The one reason it is so much more common here 
than anywhere else is because this is the area where you are going to see some of the highest numbers of the correct type of tick that transmits the disease. The next disease to discuss is also a zoonotic disease called brucellosis. Brucellosis is found in nature in cows, goats, and sheep, many of your different farm animals. It is caused by the bacteria brucellia with various species. You can get this disease by ingesting contaminated food. Most of the time these contaminated foods are found as imports from Mexico. This is one of the main reasons we have had to have de had to develop much more strict guidelines on our imports on certain types of food. Brucellosis is not a deadly infection. It is just an infection that is not any fun to get. People with brucellosis typically have fever, malaise, night sweats, and pretty extreme muscle aches. The next bacterial infection is one that is probably much more common and much more commonly known. It is called anthrax. Anthrax is caused by the bacteria Bacillus anthracis. Whether or not anthrax is dangerous depends on the way that you contract anthrax. Anthrax, the bacteria Bacillus anthracis, is found in almost every soil sample you could take and it is found within almost all grazing animals because they eat the grass where the bacteria and the spores are found. If you get Bacillus anthracis in an open cut, the open wound will start growing the bacteria and you get a black scab forming called a black eschar. This is not a dangerous form of anthrax. It is called cutaneous anthrax. Very treatable. If you ingest some sort of food that has not been properly cooked and it contains Bacillus anthracis endospores, you get gastrointestinal anthrax. Gastrointestinal anthrax has about a 50% mortality rate. People with gastrointestinal anthrax typically have signs and symptoms such as nausea, abdominal pain, and often bloody diarrhea. The deadly form of anthrax is called pulmonary anthrax. You get pulmonary anthrax by inhaling the anthrax endospores. If you inhale a qu high enough quantity of anthrax endospores, you will begin running a low fever, coughing, and having chest pain. Within 24 to 36 hours, most people will die from pulmonary anthrax. This is another disease that is very high on the list for potential biological warfare. Our next bacterial disease is gas gangrene. This is one that a lot of students typically get mixed up on, so I want to make sure I explain it to you very well. You have to have a progression of things happen for someone to get gas gangrene. The first thing that has to happen is ischemia. Ischemia is loss of a blood supply to a particular area of the body. This has absolutely nothing to do with bacteria. Often people that are diabetic will have loss of blood supply to a particular area. Once you get loss of blood supply, then you no longer have oxygen flow to the area, so you end up with necrosis, which is death of the tissue in that area. Once that happens, then you can develop gangrene, which is death of soft tissue. Up until this point, none of this has had anything to do with bacteria. Once someone has gangrene, then a bacteria called Clostridium perforangens, commonly found in the soil, intestines, found in a lot of places, can move into that dead tissue. Clostridium perforangens is an obligate anaerobe. Therefore, when your tissue is dead, this bacteria loves to grow in it. The growth of this bacteria leads to gas gangrene, which speeds up the death of your tissue and leads to gas production. When someone develops gas gangrene, the typical treatment plan is to surgically remove the dead tissue and give antibiotics to kill any bacteria present in the dead tissue. 
a lot of times they will also use a hyperbaric chamber. A hyperbaric chamber is an area of high oxygen concentrations. The high oxygen concentration will kill the bacteria because it is an obligate anaerobe. The next bacterial disease I included in our discussions just because most people do not necessarily realize this is a real disease. The disease is called cat scratch fever. You actually can get a bacterial infection from a cat scratch. This is caused by a bacteria that is commonly found within the claws of a cat. It doesn't hurt the cat, but when you are scratched by the cat, you get a papule in the area where the cat scratch happened. The bacteria then moves into your bloodstream, causes massive swelling of all of the lymph nodes. Not a deadly infection. The next bacterial disease is called the plague or black death. The plague is caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis. Yersinia pestis is a bacteria commonly found in rats. That is the reservoir. The way humans typically contract the plague is by a flea biting the rat and then coming and biting a human. When this happens, the bacteria is now moves through your bloodstream and your lymphatic system. The most common sign we see with the plague is called a bubo. This occurs typically in the axillary region shown in this picture where you have extremely swollen lymph nodes. Now, there was a huge outbreak of the plague back in around the time of the 500s to the late, late 700s in Europe. And this is what we know as the Black Death. The reason the issues were so severe then, number one, we didn't have antibiotics to treat this, but also people lived in much closer proximity to a rat than we would ever consider doing now. In 550 times in Europe, if a rat ran across your floor, it, you wouldn't freak out like you would today if a rat happened to be around you. So all it took was one person getting the plague, and then other people could get the plague from that human. Human-to-human -human transmission of the plague occurs by a droplet mechanism. Back in these Back during the last big outbreak, the Black Death, people were around each other in very close proximity, constantly spreading the plague back and forth. People became scared of the disease. They started sequestering themselves into little regions, just spreading the disease back and forth. A lot of people died from the plague. This is not just a disease of history. There are still reported cases of the plague every year in the United States. Now, if you look at this picture here, all of the cases of the plague that were reported occur out in the West. They do not occur in really in our parts of the country. And you can see that the concentration of the disease is more here in the extreme southern portions, but they are found throughout the West. All of these cases of the plague are going to be rat to flea to human transmission. The next bacterial disease is Lyme disease. Lyme disease is caused by the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi. Borrelia burgdorferi typically lives in mice and deer. It is transmitted from mice and deer to humans through a tick bite. When the tick bites you, the primary sign that you have Lyme disease, you have contracted Borrelia burgdorferi, is a bullseye pattern rash at the site of injection. If treatment is not received for Lyme disease, the Lyme disease will move through your bloodstream, next causing the secondary symptom, an irregular heartbeat. If the disease is maintained within the human body, the human will then display arthritis as the Borrelia burgdorferi settles into the joints. This picture here shows you the typical life cycle of Borrelia burgdorferi. It moves through both types of reservoirs until the tick transmits it to you. 
Most cases of Lyme disease in the United States are found in the early spring, typically in the extreme northeast and middle northern parts of the country. I'm going to conclude this audio lecture at this point, and then we'll pick back up and cover the viral diseases and protozoan diseases within this chapter.